This is a lecture I gave to the local health workers in Tilburg, the Netherlands. Damnation is marked in red. It is one of the top areas where pelvic floor surgery is done in the Netherlands. More than 400 procedures are done per year. With a focus on especially the anterior vaginal wall, a rethinking of the approach to vaginal wall collapse will be presented. It is always difficult to change one's fixed ideas into something new. My task today is to put forward questions and provide some answers. It is obvious that the learned listener may come to his or her own conclusions. One of the most commonest ailments in the woman is the collapse of the vaginal wall, a non-life-threatening condition, but it can be very crippling. The most prone area for occurrence and also the area where suboptimal surgical results occurs is the anterior wall and hence the focus on this area. The recent phase of mesh surgery and the mess it left behind direct us to a new approach, an approach that should not leave the patient at a disadvantage, especially if suboptimal results follows primary surgery. In 2016, we need to stand back from what we are doing in pelvic floor surgery and some urgent questions had to be asked. Why do we put a focus in pelvic floor on the contents of the hernial sac and make that the diagnosis? In other disciplines, that is not done for specific reasons. The anatomical reference to the hernia is surely more important than the mere contents of the hernial sac, especially if one contem contemplate surgical options. What do you think is the diagnosis to be treated in this patient, and is it necessary to treat her mild disease? Would you think it is a sister kill? Or do you see the high transverse anterior wall defect and the paravesical defect? Let's open the skin transversely. The support of the anterior wall is defective, where it attached to the cervix with a peritoneal sac present. Underneath this bulge is no bladder present, but only peritoneal sac. The diagnosis here should be high transverse defect and not a cystocure. Classification systems needed are to help with not only decision making, re type of surgery needed, but also need to put the basis forward from which we can compare different treatment modalities as well as predict surgical outcome. Do the present system do that? When one is dealing with suboptimal and optimal surgical results, the definition there is critical, especially when one wants to determine who, why did the primary surgery fail, especially in evaluating the surgical options taken primarily? The importance of the primary surgeon and his surgical expertise also need to be under scrutiny. The all-important question in 2016 is what is meant with native tissue surgery? The utilization of native tissue in surgery also demands that the native tissue should be treated with respect. The surgery must follow the basic surgical principles as outlined by Halstead in his tenets. The whys can only be answered if one has proper knowledge of these principles. And this lecture is going to be all about those. A paradigm shift in thinking is urgently needed. These are the weapons that, are that we are manned with in our fight against collapsing vagina wall. How much sense do these push and pull techniques make? If one looks from this perspective at what we have as amateur at the present, one really needs to stand back and ask yourself, do we fulfill our role as doctors? 
The art of medicine dictates that the patient brings symptoms to us to enable us to diagnose the underlying disease and treat that to cure her complaint, not only to try and give symptomatic relief. In 2006, I stood back from my practices of the past and asked myself the following basic questions. Why do products occur? Why do our primary procedures fail? What is the influence of our primary surgery on subsequent surgeries? What is native tissue surgery? We sought out answers through a strict surgical auditing process and did found some answers but also some new questions appears. The basic principles of tissue-guided regenerative surgery could be developed as a template for future surgical though. The basic phases we went through over seven years of painstakingly strict surgical auditing are listed. Most of the answers were found in recognizing the importance of fostering the native tissue during surgery and the su subsequent repair techniques. The schematic out timeline of these processes showed, shows how they overlapped. The focus was not only on optimal surgical outcomes, but also how the primary surgery influenced the subsequent surgery needed. At first glance, one would think that this mesh surgery of anterior prolift should be superior until you realize that the secondary surgery in those who needed subsequent surgery is very challenging compared to what can be done for bridging failure in the xenograft group. Of note is that the inflammatory reaction that is induced by the polypropylene is ongoing, hence the long period where suboptimal results are found in the prolif group. That's 13 months against compared to only 7.3. The histology and microscopic comparisons mirror these findings. Polypropylene, microscopically, showed much more inflammatory reaction than the xenograft group, and the xenograft group also induced ingrowth of normal uh, fascia and structures like blood vessels and muscle and also nerves. Microscopically, the difference is marked and one can easily see from this the damage that is done in a suboptimal prolift group compared to a suboptimal result with a xenograph. A few pointers in our experience are the following. Diagnosis of defects that leads to the prolapse is crucial. Synthetics are not all the same. Native tissue needs to be protected. Wound healing stands central to surgical outcome. The first surgeon is the most important surgeon. Age differences in response to surgery is of note. Suture materials, suture techniques will influence wound healing. Regeneration of tissue during wound healing can be manipulated. The sequence of dissection and procedures is important. The basis of surgery is the ability of the patient to heal. A difficult to control partner. Know the timeline that wound healing takes. Wound strength is only 50% after six months, and this will dictate the surgical outcome definitions and assessments. The interaction between the inflammatory phase and scar formation and remodeling modeling is crucial. The more intense the inflammatory phase is, the more scarring will occur. Surgical manipulation of wound healing phases is shown here. The extracellular matrix is the protector of the stem cells. 
if it is damaged, as happened with the proteolytic enzymes of the inflammatory phase, the stem cells are ineffective and regenerating in regenerating normal cells. TGR surgery can be the future of prolapse surgery. The surgeon must allow the tissues to guide him to the defects present. This can be attained by meticulous dissection in the surgical planes and the defects will lead the surgeon towards the individual repair needed. For the purpose of this lecture, we will focus on point one and to a lesser extent to the other points outlined. The defects in the collagen support structure of the vaginal wall are usually secondary with muscular and nerve injuries, the primary occurrence. The collagen layers are, however, the main building blocks of the vaginal reconstructive surgeon and therefore the most important structures to utilize for diagnostic and surgical purposes. The fascial sheets must be seen as a continuum of a three-dimensional structure simplified here as a one-dimensional sheet. Different names are given to different parts of this, but they cannot be separated from each other both functionally and anatomically. This fascia condensed around the cervix is a perisophagic ring which is a central center of support. A topog map of this fascial support can be made and the different features is marked here. This can be used as a template for classifying different defects. The fascial sheet is a fibrous mesh that is transversed by important structures, example blood vessels and the ureter. It's not palpable when not under strain and difficult to identify macroscopically in the cadaver. If tensions, tensioned though, it is felt as strong ligamentous strands as demonstrated here. This is the so-called ligaments. It can be said that the uterosacral cardinal ligaments can only be identified when either the perisophagal ring is tensioned, example during surgery, or during prolapse. To understand tissue-guided regenerative surgery, one needs to understand the pathology present in prolapse and also the fundamentals in wound healing. Let's focus on the pathology of the anterior vaginal wall. The defects or tears in the fascial sheet supporting the anterior vaginal wall can be classified into distinct groups. They occur at specific weak points that is usually along the side wall and perisophagal ring attachments. These weak points will be the attachment of these fibers bilaterally of the midline as it fuses with the vaginal skin, the cardinal ligament as part of the anterior perisophagal ring and the lateral attachments to the arcus. The arcus is near the ischial spine, a fusion of the arcus tendineus fasci pelvis and the arcus tendineus of the levator ani. These are the spots where defects are found, anterior perisophagal ring defects and paravesical defects. The high transverse defect or anterior perisophagal ring defect will follow this follow will follow the following sequence. The cardinal ligament splits centrally, become avulsed from the cervical ring and retracts laterally. This is seen as a dimple in the lateral vaginal skin topographically. When the posterior perisophagal ring is damaged too, the cardinal ligament will split into an anterior posterior fibers as it retracts from the cervix. The high transverse defect is in reality an anterior perisophagal ring defect. The cardinal ligament is centrally torn and retracts laterally. Cervical support is anteriorly defective, as is the attachment of the pubocervical fascia to the cervix. The resultant defect will look like this. The cardinal ligament is evolved from the cervix, but still attached to the skin, and the anterior cul-de-sac sac is deepened. Either bladder, wall, or peritoneal sac will be in direct contact with the vaginal skin. Schematically, one can draw the defect as shown. 
The topographic features is re readily recognized as defective rugae supracervically as shown here. The defects that occur when the fascial sheet is torn from its attachment to the arcus tendinus fasci pelvis or white line is sometimes referred to as paravaginal defects. The latter view of the pelvic side will show the fusion between the arcus tendinus fasci pelvis and the arcus tendinus levator ani. The sketch show also how the lateral sulci of the anterior vaginal wall is supported by the arcus tendinus fasci pelvis. The retracting the rotating chin of the baby with delivery will put stain on the fused area where the arcus of the two meet, just above the ischial spine. The paravesical defects are thus always at or near the ischial spine where the arcus tendineus fasci pelvis and the arcus tendineus lavata ani unite. It can be postulated that there is a split between the two from here it dissects anterior towards the symphysis pubis. The placing of the sidewall sutures, marked here as A and B, must correspond with this defect to enable the surgeon to give maximum, maximal support to the repair needed. This will be dealt with when the corrective surgery is to be discussed. Its anatomical location is more anteriorly and the correct anatomical reference should be paravesical and not paravaginally. These defects will thus be referred in this lecture as paravesical defects. Schematically, paravesical defects is shown. Paravesical defects may be unilateral or bilateral and can be to a large extent be seen on vaginal topography as absent lateral sulci. They are more common in the young patient, is not always associated with gross anatomical deviation, but to give rise to severe disabilities in some cases. In this video, the central paracervical defect is closed with two prolene sutures. A right paravesical defect is demonstrated. Note the fat on the bladder sidewall and the absent bleeding from this old tear. Tufts in this latter part of the video, two sutures were placed on the right defective area. These were, uh, come directly from the pelvic side wall, A and B sutures as shown previously. And on the left side, only one suture is done. The central suture is from the cervix. This is used to anchor the rolled xenograph onto the cervix. This rolled piece of xenograph is used Utilized to push the lateral torn fiber sheet towards the sidewall as a super suture to keep the itches approximated tension free for six months. This is vaginal site and site specific repair on TGR some principles, as will be discussed in a separate video. In this series, high transverse defects were found to be more common in the older patients, with paravesical defects more common in the young. Small wonder that coporophis does not work, especially in the young patient. Combination of high transverse or HDD or paravesical defects and paravesical defects, defects can be found. And this is shown here schematically. The pericervical support anterior posterior is provided by the lateral extension of the fibrous sheet shown here schematically with the relationship between the cardinal ligament laterally, the uterocycle ligament posteriorly and the pubicervical ligament anteriorly. In anterior posterior perisovic ring defects, the cardinal ligaments split laterally as shown. The apex of the triangle needs to be pulled towards the lateral cervical surface to re-support the lateral fornix and give vaginal length. This will be discussed in the different videos on these repairs. 
Vaginal topography can show bilateral shallow sulci and decreased rugae supracervically plus bilateral split cardinal ligaments on the lateral fornix. This patient also had a posterior cervical ring defect. The lateral split of the cardinal ligament is pronounced in central apical defects as shown in Procedentia. One can see how it is continuous with the anterior septum and also with the posterior septum. And the purpose of surgery would be to reattach the anterior, bring the cardinal ligament onto the anterior surface of the cervix and also onto the lateral side of the cervix. The last surgical point that I would like to highlight is the preference of transverse vaginal skin incision. This is done one centimeter above the external cervical os and have a few advantages of which exposure and safety are the main ones, as is the absence of scar tissue formation during wound healing. The surgical field is shown here schematically. Note the red zone of the ureter and bladder and which is not involved in the surgical field. An important safety feature. The vertical incision, skin incision is made. If a vertical skin incision is made, the central attachment of the fascia is often confused as a central defect. In 774 consecutive anti-wall dissections, the author did not see in an isolated central defect. This is a normal anatomical feature and not a defect. 12 months results of anterior vaginal wall primary TGR surgery was done in 208 cases in 2013 and 2014. I would like to show you the 12 months follow-up. 6 and 9% suboptimal results in primary repairs. A special note is that follow-up surgery in them was simple, short and of low morbidity with good surgical outcomes. This was only a micro view into a very complex subject. TGR surgery is the future. Thank you. In the dissection of the central anti-vaginal wall, the principles of tissue-guided regenerative surgery are utilized to its fullest. This video will take the TGR surgeon through the basic steps of TGR surgical dissection as the superficial surgical plane of the anterior vaginal wall is atraumatically opened. The diagnostic purpose of this dissection is to identify the defect on the anterior vaginal wall and the corresponding still healthy fascial sheet that can be utilized to close the hernia on the central anterior wall. The entry through the skin is with a transverse incision supracervically. With pinpoint blunt dissection, the superficial surgical plane is opened with a push spread motion of the scissors under constant tension counters tension and hemostasis is obtained with cauterization of blood vessels as encountered. This dissection cannot be done without the instruments listed. It is non-negotiable to do TGR surgery without these instruments especially the and the Bryski retractors, Rosister pins, the Kochers, the Lone Star retractor are essential tools as is the fine dissecting scissors. The anterior cervical lip is pulled with a cocker to the left side. This allows the identification of the skin fold running from the retracted cardinal ligament skin attachment to the severe inferior edge of the fascia. By pulling this cocker to the right and removing the cervical cocker, a second cocker can be applied to the skin fold on the left, creating a transverse running skin fold between the two cochers approximately one centimeter above the cervix. This marks the site of skin incision, which is done from right to left with a number 10 blade. Note the angle with which the knife is held. At the corners of the skin incision, four hooks are anchored to the lone star frame, stabilizing the skin incision.
The cochas are removed and placed on the inferior skin edge. A hook anchors the superior skin incision to the frame. The key points, transfer skin incision after the cervical field is marked by two cochas, one centimeter above the cervix, and the supportive hooks of the retractor that are applied to the corners to put tension on the surgical field. With the index finger in the vaginal cavity and pulling on the two cochas with the left hand, the surgeon put the surgical field under controlled tension. In this video, one can see the stretched fascial remnants with a probably iatrogenic tear in the middle. When the inferior edge of this is being cut with sharp dissection, the underlying central defect is laid bare. It contains peritoneum as shown by the presence of fatty tissue and the thin peritoneal membrane. It is obvious that this cannot be named a cystic kilt. In a, any bleeders or blood vessels encountered are cauterized. The replacing of the two cochas with the atraumatic peon help to protect the native tissue. Blonde dissection downwards towards the cervical stroma with a closed scissors blade open the superficial surgical plane and the inner surface of the cervical stroma. This dissection is completed by utilizing the Bryski retractor blade. This blade also is used to protect the underlying tissues. In this case, peritoneal cavity, in others it can be a herniated bladder. Placing of a central Maxon O on a 5H robust needle into the cervical stroma complete this part of the surgery. This is the central anchor suture that will be utilized later. Key points are the dissection is first taken downwards to the cervical stroma after the superficial surgical plane is opened with sharp dissection followed by blonde dissection with the scissors. Hemostasis is attained by cauterizing the perforating blood vessels. Atraumatic peons support the skin to minimize skin trauma. The Bryski retractor not only protect the bladder during surgery but also assist the blunt dissection. The 5H curvature of the needle on the monofilament suture material is essential to take deep bites into the underlying soft tissues. Attention is now focused on the bladder base and the dissection of the vagina skin from the underlying fascial sheet. This is done by taking the skin edge with two cochas. Note that the sequence is to remove first the two lateral loops, apply the two cochas and then remove the central loop. The fascial edge is easily demonstrated and the plane to be opened identified. With an index finger of the surgeon's left hand in the vaginal cavity and by pulling on the two cochas by an assistant directly vertical upwards, the surgical field is tensioned to improve the dissection to follow. First, sharp dissection into the superficial surgical plane. The inner white surface of the skin is a landmark that the plane is entered with blunt scissor push spread motions. With a sufficient surface on the skin beard, the two cochas can be replaced by two peons to protect the skin. The two cochas are placed on the dis dissected fascial edge, note the direction of pull. The two cochas by the surgeon directly at a 90 degree angle to the peons, which is held by the assistant. The direction of dissection with the scissors is from medial sideways in the direction of the patient's shoulder. There is no need to dissect the medial aspect of the surgical field. The fascial sheet is thinnest central and thickest lateral, a normal anatomical feature that can be confused with a central defect. A third cocker is applied on the fascial sheet as the dissection is taken supralateral upwards. Note the angle at which this cocker is applied. Bleeders, blood vessels, when encountered, are cauterized. This dissection with application and reapplication of cochers in a stepwise fashion, alternating left and right, is done till a solid bite of the fascia is found bilaterally. The patient can be moved on the table with these two cochers when this point is reached. The fascia is mobilized up to the inner surface of the superior army of the pubic bone. The last part of the surgical plane is opened with a dissecting index finger. Note the skin support and the direction of pull by peons, which replaced the hooks during the surgical phase. The reattachment of the fascial edge to the cervical stroma can now be done.
Once again is sharp dissection followed by blunt dissection to open the superficial surgical dissection planes. To protect the native tissue and the skin, a few supportive actions is needed. This includes the index finger in the vagina to stabilize the skin during sharp dissection, replacement of the cochus by eye traumatic clamps, concentrating on the lateral fascial sheet and mobilizing the fascial sheet up to the pubic rami to allow movement medially when the fascia is suited to the cervical stroma. The angles in which instruments are being held during dissection go a long way in supporting the surgeon with plain dissections. The final judgment of the wound healing process that will take the remodeling phase away from the scar tissue forming inflammatory phase depends on the type of suturing that is to be done. This will be the final legacy of the surgeon. This will be the subject of the next phase in repairing the anterior compartment damage.